kind of composite, composite system, which is a kind of equilibrated system. But what is the second step? Second step is the decay. So first, formation, fusing of the two systems. Second is decay. What is the key element? The key element here is for the independence hypothesis. This is the idea. Now we start we started by Bohr. And the idea is that the modes of decay of the compatible nucleus are independent on the way in which the nucleus will decay. It means that the system, once it is created, it will decay independently on the way in which I created it. So this is called also the decay, typically said, the decay has no memory of the way in which the nucleus was formed. So if I form this nucleus, the same nucleus, with the same example, angular momentum, the same excitation energy, same condition, it will decay exactly in the same way, no matter how the system was formed. This is a very basic part of this moment. It's also called memoryless decay. And this is an example. One of the reasons the particles are going now everywhere, in principle, if the system does not memory, or does not lose memory of how it was formed, particles should go in a direction which is very similar to the direction of the incident beam. Okay? Because in this way, particles remember the initial velocity. If particles scatter everywhere, it means that they don't remember anymore. No, what, what is, they say they don't have any uh, uh, quantity that uh, as a memory of the incident energy. I have here a very nice picture that a student of mine made a while ago that tells you how this is going to go. Are going to go. So the system rotates for some time and start evaporating particles around. This is the main idea. So formation and decay are two independent steps. This opens a whole new possibility for understanding our process. So once you have a compound nucleus, it can evaporate protons and becomes what is called evaporation residue. Obviously, these two steps, formation and decay, are independent beside few things. An example, conservation law. So we still have to conserve energy, angular momentum, and uh, parity, and many other things. Charge, uh, charge number, mass number, and so on. What is the simple explanation that Bohr gave for this? The most simple thing that all physicists should do. Look for analogy. How people could understand this, this uh, process? OK, he invented this idea of this basin, where you have uh, a billiard balls. OK, you hit the ball, and you throw a ball inside this basin. What will happen? That th this ball will start to kick all the other balls, and they start to kick each other. So in this way, the initial kinetic energy of this uh, particle is distributed randomly. You cannot predict how all the balls uh, will hit each other. And eventually, after this random distribution, one of these balls will get enough energy to get out. OK? What we have to suppose? Next time, we have to suppose there is elastic con uh, 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 collision between this particle. If there is a kind of uh, friction, part of the energy will not come out anymore, but will go into heat, obviously. But this is a very simple scheme to understand that some energy, if, suppose that in this basin there are no balls. If there are no balls, the ball, this heated, heated ball, will go in and out again, immediately. Instead, before we uh, have a particle coming outside, it will take some time, because this particle, if it's true, some, some way we can imagine there is some kind of statistical equilibrium, so all the particles are more or less the same energy, and then, Whenever some will get a little bit more, it will get up. So the distribution of this energy also includes fluctuations. So we cannot predict what is, uh, will be the sequence of collisions. So this is called a kind of stochastic process. Another thing that, that uh, Bohr did is say, OK, we can look at this phenomenon like the heating of a drop. You know that Bohr was also the inventor, the one who suggested the model, the liquid drop of a nucleus, that the nucleus behaves like a, a liquid drop, a charged liquid drop. So what it is, okay, let's hit this ball with uh, some projectile, and 
the, the temporary loading system will increase. Uh, obviously, the system will cool down how? by emitting another particle. And this is shows that the temperature is higher, you can see it a little bit, then the temperature is lower, then you can have some kind of radiation like photo until the temperature is zero. The nucleus, the temperature of the nucleus is zero. Okay? So, this also tells us that in principle we can start thinking about a kind of analogy between the emission of a particle from a nucleus with the evaporation of a, a liquid drop. Okay, this is a science. If you guys don't have this one, I can give it to you. Okay, so now the idea is that the reaction is not a straight reaction A plus X that goes in B plus Y, but there is an intermediate stage. So, in this case, the reaction proton plus aluminum has some intermediate nucleus which is called, which is called the compound nucleus. This compound nucleus has a mass, which is the sum of the mass, as a charge, which is the sum of the charges. So, this will be silicon 28. Then, eventually, will decay in alpha plus magnesium, which is the output channel we have observed. This reaction usually is written also in such a short way. This is usually the, uh, mm, what is called the uh, projectile, this is the target, this is the ejectile, and this is the nuclear, which is the residue. So, in general now, the reaction that go through a intermediate states have this special different kind of notation. So, I'm, I'm going uh, very slowly, but I'll try to pick up now. What are the consequences of this hypothesis? Besides writing the reaction in a different way, what can we say more now? In principle, we can say that in principle we can produce nitrogen-14 by combining different projectile and target, target. And in principle, uh, we don't know why, uh, if possible, it can decay in many other projectiles. These are non-nuclear, so I, if I sum the mass and the charge, I can always find the split that combined together will give uh, nitrogen-14. And in principle, I also can reverse. I can reverse the output channel before, and consider this the input channel. And in principle, I can reverse completely. All of this reaction, in principle, should go through nitrogen-14. And we can think of any sample. Uh, we can take neon-20, uh, we can take many combinations of projectile target, and end up in many other combinations as the output channel. All of these combinations concern the mass and the charge of the system. Uh, obviously, the question is, are all of these allowed? Because, you know well, in thermodynamics, the first principle tells you that you can conserve the energy. You must conserve the energy. But the second principle tells you that not all the combinations, not all the possibilities that are consistent with the principle, first principle, are indeed allowed. So, this holds here too. Because we know well that thermodynamics is probably the strongest no, background for the physicist. Now, what is the, uh, the, um, uh, some of the consequences? Uh, obviously, if now we create the same compound nucleus in a different ways, uh, we create the same compa excited compound in the same, same different way, its decay should not depend on the way in which it was formed. So, if I look at the proton spectrum, example in this decay, this proton spectrum should have exactly the same shape independent of how I created this nucleus. So, my point is that energy spectra of the residues and of the particles, so residues, I mean ejectile and residues, should overlap. Following, obviously, contra, the law of conservation of the kinematics. Not only this, but the direction of emission of the product should not remember the initial direction of the beam. So there should be signatures of isotropy. So emission should be everywhere. But in principle, there can be some privileged direction, some direction which has still a particular meaning. Why is this? Because remember, we need to conserve the angular momentum. And the angular momentum is always considered to be a direction around which something may happen. Okay? So, if we observe some anisotropy, 
This MSO should not be related to the fact that we are creating an equilibrium system. It should be related to the fact that this system may have some angular momentum that is conserved. But we look for this later. So, what is the other consequence? The other consequence is that if the formation and decay are two independent states, how can we write the probability of the production of this output channel if we have this entrance channel? Well, we know that from probability, I hope you remember this, that if we have two events which are independent, okay, the probability of have that specific combination of events, A and B, is written is the product as the product of the two probabilities. Okay, when two events are independent, then I can write the probability that that event occurs as the, the product of the two probability. Now I can turn this into cross-section because I said this is uh, uh, the same thing as probability. So I can say that the cross-section of having the product B once the project are EA can be written as the product of two factors. One is the, the uh, cross-section for the formation. So it means what is the probability to fuse the system? Times the probability of having that specific output channel. So this, in this case, the first step is the production. The second event is the decay. If these two events are independent, formation and decay, the cross-section of having that particular output channel, channel is the product of the two. So this is another consequence not only isotropy, not only the fact that spectrum mass overlap, another consequence of the independent hypothesis is that this cross section must be the product of the two. So this is the probability of compound nucleus of decay in a channel B. This is the probability of absorbing. This is sometimes also connected to what is the capture cross section, but we will talk about this later. Now, we can express this probability of decay in many ways. You know that there is something which is called the width of a layer or the life, lifetime of the decay for some specific nucleus. And uh, this lifetime is connected to uh, what we call the gamma, which is called also the decay width. This is a consequence of the uh, indetermination principle. I hope you are familiar with this. So if I have an unstable system that survives some time, okay? we can assign to this system a probability of decay which is 1 over tau. No, this is a known formula. So, in principle, we can write the probability per uh, uh, unit of time as a quantity which is related to this quantity gamma, which is called the uh, decay width. Okay? In principle now, as we have seen before, this uh, compound system can decay not only, maybe, not only in proton, but in principle can decay in neon plus the biscuit per the neutron, neutron plus a gamma, fluorine plus a deuterium. So each time that I form a nucleus, it can decay in many ways. So I can assign to each decay way, okay, that I indicate is a probability. So I can emit the alpha, I can emit the neutron, I can emit the gamma, and so on. And obviously, how can I calculate this probability? By doing this ratio, the ratio of uh, the decay width in a certain channel, divided by the sum of all the possibility, possible decay chains. Okay? So in principle, I can write now the new cross-section by using this ratio 